Thank you, Tracy. Um, it is a privilege for me to be able to talk to you today. I know that many of you have been doing Agile as well, and uh, we can learn from each other. So today we are looking specifically at distributed Agile and uh, how we can optimize that um, in, uh, in our Agile teams. The, um, I, I'm uh, Stefan van der Merwe. I'm uh, the CTO at Covalience. I've been working in the, in the industry for about 27 years now, uh, 10 years as a software developer, and then uh, about three years as a SAP HCM consultant. And then I worked for 14 years so far as a, as a CTO for two different companies here in India. So uh, the, the first, as uh, Tracy said, will be a short presentation from my side. We'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll have questions and answers. So uh, Mike, Mike Cohen is the, one of the Scrum co-founders. He said um, this following quote, I'm just uh, gonna read some of it. With multi-team projects being the reality, you need to know how to scale and how to work with agile distributed teams. Um, these things, uh, what, what he said here is, is extremely important in our current day because you know that as we, as we try to scale um, our systems, our, 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 uh, our projects, um, more and more companies are reaching um, abroad, finding uh, development teams in other places, and, um, and so it becomes distributed. And even in, now in COVID times, um, everyone sitting at home is uh, becoming, becoming even more and more distributed. And uh, so it's, it's uh, essential that we find the best ways to work with our distributed agile teams. And uh, we are going to try to share some of the insights that we've had so far in, in this journey. There are many challenges to distributed agile, as you may know, communication over the distance, um, the time zones cause uh, less overlap between uh, various teams. You have the, the security problem that, that comes out as people sit um, at home distributed. Um, it, it, there are uh, actually during this COVID times, there were more hacks than ever before. Um, productivity and quality issues also come into it. And so uh, whereas um, it is, it is the strategy that, that is the go-to strategy now is to do it uh, agile distributed. There are some uh, challenges in it and uh, we need to find ways to, to work effectively around those challenges or through those challenges. Um, let's go to strategy number one of the four strategies that, um, that I'm going to share. The first one is building um, good relationships. In, um, excuse me, in agile, we value individuals in interactions over processes and tools. Um, and, and that is um, because the, uh, the agile teams are really um, about that all that interactions because we are self-organizing teams, cross-functional teams, and it, re it requires a high level of engagement. The challenge is that, as I said already, over the distance, the physical, the cultural, the time zone differences, it just becomes um, more challenging to do that. Um, we need um, to have these strong relationships. To, in order to, to do proper um, um, agile in the, in the distributed environment. We need a friendly, safe environment that promotes better engagement between all the members of the team, that good relationships, that help build trust, and the trust then um, helps us with the necessary uh, conflict that we need to have. Um, so conflict is necessary because if you don't have conflict, then it's maybe just one person thinking, and, uh, you know, and then, then you are missing the vast potential of all the members of your team. So let's look at some of the best practices that we found in, in building relationships. So uh, firstly, uh, I found that um, we need to care about our teammates. You know, if we, if we start there, um, then the, the rest of it becomes easier, but it's, it's good to be very um, uh, intentional about creating the space for those relationships to form. And so we, we make space in our meetings um, in, you know, during uh, maybe the first five minutes, to, to have some time for social interaction, to talk about family, to talk about what's happening in your life, you know, hobbies, whatever else is important to you, the game that happened on Saturday. These, these type of things um, are, uh, are very important. We, we also bring in like icebreakers from time to time. You can have, and there are, there are many things and you can think of uh, many ways to do this, to, um, to like, uh, for instance, have a blog post for each person in the team to tell about his hobbies and what is important to him. And, and especially in the beginning of, uh, of the relationship um, of a new product team, it's important to, to get um, a, a little bit more time to get to know each other personally. 
Um, turning on the videos in calls are important. I know that we don't always like that. You know, I think Zoom fatigue is, is a real thing. I've experienced it myself. Um, however, it is important because facial expressions, uh, non-verbal communication is important to get to know someone. If it's just a voice on the line, it's, it's, it's very hard to do. Um, but there are places um, for just um, without camera. There's space for that as well, or having rather a, an email uh, rather than a meeting or, or just a chat communication as well. But, um, but the, you know, the video and call, videos and calls are important. And then when possible, you need to even go and meet your teammates wherever they are, you know, get, um, buy a plane ticket and go. I know currently it's a little bit more challenging sometimes to find a visa and, and do this, but whenever that is possible, um, make it happen. Um, we need to also not, not just share the requirements and what you want to get done, but you need to also share why you want to get those things done. Your business goals. Why is this important to you? And as you share that, then the, um, the, the various individuals in your team can buy into your vision, they can buy into your goals, and they become much more engaged in the work that they do for you. Um, so so that, that is something that, um, that I would encourage. Then also, we need to cultivate an open and safe team culture. Um, whatever that means for you, uh, we need to encourage trust and, and, and however we can do this. Now, uh, you know, in, in uh, cross-cultural situations, um, it is sometimes a little, uh, you know, not known as to how, to how to go about that. But if you, if you truly listen to your colleague, if you listen to the person working with you, I feel one can bridge many of those gaps. I need to listen, create space for it, be intentional about it, and then you can have that healthy conflict, which is necessary to really get the best product that you need to have. So let's uh, go to the next strategy. So here we, uh, we talk about quality. Quality is um, uh, also harder in a distributed team. Um, there is less oversight. There is, it is more difficult to observe uh, the code quality. Um, it, is, it is a little, challenge, a little bit challenging sometimes. Um, it's very important that we have this. Now, sometimes people say, um, you know, in an agile environment, it is maybe not that important, but I want to read that quote about uh, quality at the top. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Many people don't understand that. They think you need to be just quick and dirty and agile and so that you can get the next uh, um, functionality out there for, for the team to look at. But um, that is actually not the way it works. Uh, we, we need to work at, the, um, at our code quality so that the viability of the code, the scalability, the maintainability of the code is, um, is, very, um, is very good. That makes us more agile. We can more easily adjust code, which is well written. So, uh, so quality code actually enhances agility. And then quality code is also more productive for those, for those same reasons. Quality, even though it might take a little bit more to generate, um, it, uh, it takes less time to maintain, to understand, and to expand, to scale. So that is, um, that, that's why quality is really important. Let's look at some of the best practices that we found. First thing, you want to be pre proactive about quality. Um, you can't expect it to just happen. Uh, you need to train for it. Uh, so in, in, um, in, in a product team, we need to um, make time for training, for coding standards, for naming conventions, um, for the approach, uh, how, to, how to approach a task. And simple things like how, how to plan properly in, um, in, in this, in this product? Uh, how, do we, how do we look not just at the current requirement, but also at the things surrounding it? Um, it is, it's the normal things that, that, that we look at, but it's very important to train for it. Um, we also need to then uh, you know, test for it. So once, once we've done code, make sure that we do proper robust code reviews. And that must be part of our sprint cycle. So every, every sprint cycle, every... Um, uh, even most of our stories, most of our tasks that we do should be um, code reviewed. There are tools that you can leverage for it, linting tools that can be used, for instance, just to clean up the code to make sure that we don't have any obvious errors. Um, but we, we also believe that you need to have a real person review the code. Um, so for that, there are also various ways to do it. Um, the, you know, you can do via pull requests. Uh, for instance, uh, a person creating the code can um, then... Uh, launch a, a, a pull request for the person who's going to review it. He will pull it, he will look at it. And then, uh, you know, if it's not quite up to standard, we'll push it back. But um, it is also important, I feel, to give the feedback, to make sure that you do 
Um, and that is part of the training. Uh, that's part of the coaching as that you, as you find some problems with the code, or even if, if, the, if the code is very good uh, to say, this is great, this is fantastic code. I like this, I like that. This is not so good. Um, and this is, these are the reasons. Let's, let's see if we can make it better. And, um, and in that way, we, um, we make the product, the quality of it much better. Now, obviously, QA and UAT user acceptance testing, those two things are really important as well. We need to do it timely. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the QA you usually have during our sprint cycle, but many times the UAT comes after that. Uh, users don't always get the time to do it, but that's where you make a mistake. You know, if, if the UAT happens too late, then it, it wastes a lot of time. This is what we found that um, many people, um, as, as they then find an error, maybe a month after the development was done, and they bring it back, then that, that developer that worked on it moved on to other codes, you know? So you need to come back to that code, you need to try to understand it again. It takes more time, it takes more effort, then it needs to go again to QA, it needs to go again to UAT. Better uh, have it shortly after the development has done. So timely QA and UAT processes, a very clear process must be there. And then what you measure gets done. Um, so one need to have metrics, you need to have a, a visible dashboard for this. This is just a small um, example that, um, that we have of, uh, of such a da dashboard. This is the one we are using. You'll see that there are two lines, the green line and the, the yellow line. Yellow line is our QA. The green line is, is our um, uh, user acceptance testing. You'll see it's sprint-wise, and there are these thresholds. And uh, the threshold need to be decided uh, within the team. What is an acceptable threshold? Um, and then obviously, as the time, the lifetime of the project goes on, that threshold should be lowered. One need to make sure that you have, um, that, that you have less errors as time goes by, get better over time. Um, and if you see something rises above the line, then that is a, that's a red flag. You need to address that issue. That's all part of ensuring good quality in our uh, distributed agile team. So let's go to the um, third strategy. Uh, this, this, may be, this may seem very dull and boring to you because documentation is such that nobody wants to do it. However, um, you know, and even Agile says prefer, we prefer working software over extensive documentation. But, but, but note, it is over extensive documentation, not above all documentation. There, there is a place for documentation, but, but one needs to do it in a balanced way. Um, one should not have, um, we should have just enough. You shouldn't have, uh, if you have too much, then you consume you know, unnecessary time. If you have too little, then it takes too much time for a new person to learn the code, to get into it. Um, and also, even if the same person comes back to the code later on or comes back to this product, project, it, you know, it takes too much time to, to study it up and to understand it again. And um, so we need to find that balance. It's very important um, that, you know, especially for knowledge transfer, um, do, to have uh, good documentation. It impacts our productivity, our maintainability, and the quality of our code across the board. So let's look at some of the best practices for that. Um, we need to understand, everybody in the team need to understand why we do documentation. Um, if it is just something that has to be done and they don't really know why, they're not going to do it properly. So we we'll need to make sure that everyone are on board and they understand what is the proper amount of documentation that needs to be done and how and why it is important. And um, we, need, we need to uh, capture not only what is happening, but we also need to capture why. You know, it's always good to know the reason because as you know the reason for something, then you can, um, then you can kind of uh, empathize with that. You can understand it. Uh, a team member will say, I understand um, what this code does or why we have the architecture like this, or um, why we've done this particular logic in this way. And, uh, and that helps us to then preserve the good uh, quality in our, in our product. Um, the, the one thing that, uh, what was it that I wanted to say? Um, yeah, so, so let's uh, skip on it, we'll come back to me. So documentation should be just in time and, and just enough. The just enough, you can, you can talk about um, what, is, what is really enough um, and try not to do too much, not too little. The just in time is also important. If you do that documentation too early, like for instance, if a product owner goes and creates all the documentation in the finest detail at the beginning of the project, um, then most probably at the time when we are ready to go into a certain feature and, and, and program that, then you find that documentation is now uh, has to change. There's, there's a lot of changes that has to be made. 
And, uh, and therefore we, we leave that documentation until it is ready, uh, very close, much closer to the time that we have to develop that particular code that we do it. Um, so yeah, just in time. Also just in time for, um, as, as a developer writes the code, document it immediately, not after the sprint, not after three months, go send him back and try to do the, do the documentation because that's gonna take much longer. Do it at the right time. Um, we also need to centralize this documentation. Uh, there are many co project collaboration tools, as you know, uh, Jira, uh, uh, Azure DevOps, um, Assembler, Monday, uh, you know, there are so many of them. And all of these have, uh, have in mind that we centralize the documentation, uh, all the stories, all the requirements in one place so that um, you, you don't lose, uh, lose some of it. Now, what often happens is somebody writes an email, on the site, they, they have a chat conversation on the site and that never goes back um, into, into your project collaboration tool. So that is, a, that is a, um, something that we need to rectify. Everything that, that you, every decision about uh, the um, requirements have to go back into this tool. Otherwise, if you, go, if you have to go and find that email, you all know how difficult it is sometimes. Let's uh, uh, you know, use those tools the way that it should be used. Um, that is well balanced documentation that I have for you. Um, actually, we there are many um, the recommendations that I have as to what we can document, and I'll just run quickly through this. Uh, like high level architecture should be there. Uh, the that is the physical architecture about the servers and where things are, and then also the logical architecture as to how's your design, how's your architecture. Uh, you have an API and a queue, and you have the code here, and you have a cron job and whatever else it is. Um, that need to be documented on a, on a high-level system architecture. Uh, flow diagrams can be important for important logic, but not for everything, because many times the logic on a particular page is, is very um, you know, self-explanatory, so you don't need to do it. Uh, the, the stories as, are important. Stories should be as detailed as possible. Uh, who does it? Wh uh, what is getting done? And then also why? And then also the, the, the acceptance criteria that we put into our stories, as well as in the impact areas that, that it has. And there are, there are other, other things that, I'm, that one can put in your story to make it clearer. Um, but but th those are really important things. Formal test cases has its place. Um, we find in Agile that in places where you have um, multiple scenarios that can come from a certain form, different ways to fill a form that can have um, various um, results, then those are things that you need uh, flow diagrams for, but not for everything. Um, then, uh, yeah, stories, obviously. Uh, then your, your video walkthroughs, it's a very simple way to, to document something. It's very fast to document. And it's very fast and easy to digest, especially for, when you, for handovers. If someone is leaving a project and you have to bring someone else in, or you, know, you just need to expand the team, bring more people in a, a video walkthrough helps a lot and it, save a lot, it saves a lot of time. Um, then also your inline documentation. Uh, I, I believe that every block needs to be commented like the bigger blocks, subroutines, uh, methods, uh, functions, those things you need to have a, a line that describes what it does and why. And then also uh, potentially even the person who did it Though you can get that from the repository, but it's sometimes just easier to have the person's name there that worked on this documentation to, to be able to ask him on this, doc, on this code. And then uh, one need to standardize your naming and your coding conventions. Obviously, um, in, if the code is well written and it is very simple and you use the right um, standards documentation um, in, 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 your, in your naming conventions, then uh, someone can read it and it, it is self-explanatory and we don't need to do a lot of documentation on it. So these are just a few ideas, and I'm sure that you have a lot of things that you can add to it. Let's go to the, the fourth strategy, uh, and that is security. Now, security was not part of Agile as Agile was invented um, more than 10 years ago. Uh, but you know, as the um, situation changed and more and more security issues uh, became apparent, um, people started trying to incorporate security also into Agile, and that is very important. We need to look at security before and while you work and not just after you're done. So it must be by design. It, um, you know, uh, the, I, I think that it is very obvious in our current um, scenario why we are talking about security. Um, I, I see that there is a lot, a lot of um, hacks. There's, there's a lot more um, of all kinds of different types of attacks that get launched against, um, against our systems. 
so uh, we need to we need to do something about this. Um, it is a challenge because in a in a distributed environment, uh, people are sitting far away in, in in your home situation. You may not have so much security as you know you're basically outside your firewall. There are threats to your IP and your data as it travels over the distance, and we need to make sure that your that your data and your IP is safe. So obviously, the you know the the reason for it is there's a, there's a huge cost um, uh, implication for it. You know GDRP, which is the European uh, Privacy Laws, uh, and has huge fines if there is a if there is a breach without doing um, due, due diligence on your protecting your data. Um, you know, it, it's not just that; it's also just the damage to your company's reputation if you should have an hack. And one can really, you really cannot afford um, any of the types of hacks that are currently going around. So we need to um, make sure as much as you can to prevent hacking um, in your product. So let's um, let's look at some of the best uh, practices there. We need to integrate security into our uh, processes in, and into our product by design, which means from the very beginning, throughout the lifetime of the development and the life cycle of your product, there should be security in place. Um, that means in an agile environment, during your scrum cycle, the, uh, the problem uh, that, uh, that is there is that because agile is running in very short cycles, you know, it's just two week cycles or even one week cycles sometimes, that before you get new functionality out there, um, there are much more, much less opportunity to test for security. And, uh, and then during every cycle, one should make sure that, they, that, that you have been um, handling your code in a secure way and that, that, that your product is secure. So, um, right, so right from the beginning in architecture decisions, one should consider security, you know? Then also you need to provide security training to all your employees and everyone in the team should be a security aware. Um, even if they, if they don't work on the system itself, if they just work on the requirements, if they just work on design, doesn't matter what they're doing, but um, they need to uh, be aware of security issues that could be there. Um, it's, it's very easy to fall for phishing attacks um, and, uh, or to click on a, uh, on a wrong uh, link in an email or, um, or to, you know, or, or simple things like, not having a strong password. Uh, many people still use the thing of using the same password everywhere. The, um, it, is, it is very important that we have um, proper password um, security in, in place. Uh, that means your system that you're writing also should be in such a way that you cannot have a weak password. It must be strong passwords. And uh, if you can remember it, uh, then it's usually not strong enough. Okay? There are certain ones, certain exceptions, where you can have a, uh, a very strong password that you can remember. But uh, I would suggest you use something like a password manager that will help you to, to choose a, a random password that's also long enough. Um, so that's just a simple, um, simple thing about passwords. One, one also need to conduct um, in a, the training, not just for awareness, but also training for your development team to build in security into your product. And um, so there are the, the OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, which have the 20, no, actually it's 10, 10 uh, highest vulnerabilities that are currently going around um, on the internet, specifically for web applications. And, uh, and these things um, need to be trained to your people as to also how to avoid them, how to mitigate those risks for every technology that you're working on. So, um, so that's an important part of training. One, one need to conduct regular security checks and audits. You need to, um, to make sure that you use some of these tools that are available, like the SAST and the DAST tools. SAST is for uh, the um, static application security testing, and then the dynamic application security testing. The tools are available. Usually your SAS tools in the IDE that you use, there will be, um, there are already some uh, SAS tools available. Like for instance, in Visual Studio, we have um, tools like Security Code Scan, Visual for Visual Studio 2019. You also have things like Veracode, um, we've got GitLab, and uh, many other tools that are that, that look at the, uh, at the code itself. So it is, um, it looks at the code well, while it is static. It's not executing at that point. That's why it's static SAS tools, and uh, so uh, you can use those. Um, then also the DAS tools, they are looking at the packages, the requests and, and that go out to the server, the replies that goes out to, uh, to the customer. 
that that work on the web application and and they will um, they will also find many many vulnerabilities by just looking at those packages um, we um, we've been using things like zap which is free it's open source uh, which is built on the on this OWASP um, vulnerabilities there's also burp suite which is uh, mostly used by hackers which is the good reason for uh, for us to also use it um, it is um, there are many others like that that um, that will help us to um, to, to find vulnerabilities before the hackers find them. So we need to also uh, ensure that our team uses VPN, um, especially when they're working from home, to use um, uh, um, uh, VPN to make sure that the, the data being transferred is secure. Also, IP access must be controlled so that only the people who must, be, must have access to something um, should have access. And that one can control on an IP per IP basis. So these are some of the security uh, strategies that we can have. Now, um, and, and that is, that's basically the four strategies that I wanted to highlight today. There are many other things that one can do, but um, I hope these give you some uh, food for thought. And with that, um, I want to go back to Tracy. Perfect. Thank you for that insightful presentation, Stefan. So before we start the panel discussion, we have a second poll, which you should see on the screen any moment now. And we're gonna go ahead and give you 30 seconds. We're gonna take a short pause just to let you fill it out. And that will kind of help guide our discussion in Q&A time. So go ahead and give you 30 seconds. Okay, great. I see the answers are still coming in here. So it looks like the first challenge um, that you guys said what's most difficult when working with distributed agile teams is building relationships. So the first one and the second one is designing with security in mind. So we'll do our best to try to address those in our discussion um, today. So now I would like to invite our other two panelists, Maggie and Rakesh, to introduce themselves before we start the discussion. So Maggie, would you mind starting us off and sharing a little bit about yourself and Arbor Technologies? Absolutely, thanks so much. Um, hey everyone, my name is Maggie Manteifel. I'm the Digital Product Manager for Arbor Technologies. Um, really excited to continue this discussion about working with distributed teams. I've been working with um, kind of remote teams for the past four years and um, love thinking about this and how we might might build better relationships and facilitate better information sharing. So yeah, excited for a great discussion. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Maggie. And Rakesh, could you introduce yourself? Thanks, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rakesh and I'm the practice lead and a certified Scrum Master for Covillians, associated with Covillians from last 11 years and nine years as a developer and five years as a Scrum Master and a project coordinator. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Rakesh. So before we start the discussion, I just wanted to give you one more quick reminder. If you have any questions you would like us to answer during the live Q&A, you can go and submit them now in the, with the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many as possible after the panel discussion. So without further ado, I guess we'll go ahead and start with the discussion. So this first question will be for Stefan. Um, in your presentation, you kind of talked about what are these key strategies for maximizing the effectiveness of a distributed team. So out of these four that you presented, which one do you believe is most important and why? Um, I, I agree with the, with the poll results. Um, I also think that building relationships are um, very crucial. It is, um, it is very important for, you know, for, the, uh, for people to, to be engaged in the work um, so that they, uh, you know, as, as, you, as you get to know people, it's much more fun to work, gives you much more joy. Um, and uh, so there's less turnover, um, less, less people who want to leave. People are happier. And I think happy people work at their best. You know, I, I also feel that um, 
if you if you enjoy what you do, then you then you're gonna do a better job at it. So it improves quality as well. So that's what I think. That's great. Thank you so much, Stefan. And uh, Rakesh, from your perspective as well, what would you say is the most important and why? I would uh, also agree with Stefan. I think uh, building relationship is is top most important. I feel it's it's like a building block for all the other things that Stefan talked about. If we have a good relationship within the team, then all the other things will will come in place automatically. Because Agile is all about people. If you take care of people uh, pretty well, then all the things will be settled down. That's what I, I feel. No, that's great. That's definitely true. And Maggie, from your perspective as a digital project manager, which one of these, from your perspective, would you say is most important? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the wild card. I definitely agree with Stefan and Rakesh, um, but I feel that documentation and balanced documentation is extremely important, um, especially as you scale up the size of the team or the people, the amount of people who are involved. Um, just because you have to have a very clear definition of why you're doing something. So I know Stefan um, touched on that as well. But being able to quickly and clearly communicate why you're working on something, kind of like the mini business case for any project or initiative that you might be focusing on, um, allows people to, you know, kind of jump into projects midstream, which happens a lot, um, and really at the core of the work, understand why you're doing something. And then they are also able to formulate like effective solutions or plan out the appropriate process or work to be done because they can quickly answer that why. That's great. Well, thank you. It's good to have both perspectives from that side as well. Um, so this is another question for you as well, Maggie. And this kind of goes back to what Rakesh and Stefan were talking about, the importance of building relationships and building trust with your team. So from your perspective, how can one go about cultivating an open and safe culture within their team and how can that possibly impact the team's effectiveness and agility? Yeah, great question. Um, so as Stefan mentioned as well, you know, it's important to set aside time for that non-work-related discussion, um, just to build those relationships, understand who's the person behind the screen or the voice phone call. Um, it's just, it's really pivotal to building that trust and building that engagement. Um, and then I found that additional kind of best practices that have worked for me is leading by example, especially in terms of being able to show vulnerability. So I think it's really hard for people if they don't have, you know, really established relationships. Maybe you haven't worked with someone for an extended period of time. But if everyone's kind of new to this team, you need to be able to stop the discussion and ask questions and show that vulnerability. Um, you know, I think people are hesitant to do that because it, it, it doesn't feel good feeling like you're the only one who may not know what's going on or need clarification, but more often than not, others are looking for that information as well. Um, so I found that, yeah, being vulnerable is, is really important to creating an effective and engaged team. Um, and then kind of along with that is being intentional about recognizing others' contributions and their wins and celebrating them. I think that goes hand in hand with building confidence about, you know, of individuals as well as overall within the team. And if you're confident, you're more likely to be vulnerable, which is going to then kind of like spark really good discussion. Um, so it's, it's important to kind of be intentional about recognizing others on the team for their contributions and for the wins of the team as a whole. And I think all together, you know, continuing to do this over time will help um, create that trust, establish communication channels, help you learn other people's communication styles, and ultimately lead to, lead to more engagement and then being able to like pivot or change direction much more quickly as well. Those are excellent insights. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's great. So Stefan, another thing that you talked about in your presentation was the importance of ensuring quality and some of the best practices around that. So what strategies have you found most helpful for maintaining and improving your team's code quality? I to think if I've got anything more to say than what I already said. Um, the, I think that of all the things that I mentioned, I suppose being proactive is best. Uh, 
to train for it. Um, so there must be there must be good training for it. The um, and and you know one can always train the skills by you know let, letting someone go through a, a through a course. Maybe they come with a lot of skills, but sometimes people come with a, with a wrong habits. So and and to and to to observe that that's where coaching and mentoring comes in, and and that's where you know the when when you look at someone and you look at his code and you talk to them and, and you, you rub shoulders with people that's you know people don't sit in his own little corner and code we we need to share so that uh, in that way we can uh, we can help each other so it's training it's formal training but it's also informal informal training i feel that um, that coaching is is more important than all the others what we've seen is people working with some of our best programmers they become like the people they work with um, it rubs off you know and uh, and so we we need to make sure that we associate the right people with each other so that they can actually um, pick up that good quality from each other as well so you know um, and that comes with with having the right process of code reviews if you don't have that you know then then you won't have the opportunity so that's great thank you stefan that's wonderful um, so this next question is still about kind of that idea of code quality. So Maggie, with your team, um, how can your team go about measuring their code quality? Are there specific metrics you use or that are important to track? What does that look like? Uh, this is definitely something that's evolving on our team right now. And I think will continue to evolve. I think within every organization, metrics are, in, it's an ever evolving discussion, I should say. Um, some of the things that we, you know, from a product perspective are trying to measure our, at the, at the very core of the experience, is a user able to complete what they set out to do? Like ha have, has what we built allowed the user to complete their task or the, their job to be done? Um, so I'm, I'm looking at it from a product perspective, from that overall user experience perspective, and like, does this meet their needs? Um, that's kind of, I think, the highest level metric that, that we've started to, to look at. And then, you know, just being a part of this team, I also work very closely with our engineer and developers to figure out what are the specific code quality metrics or technical metrics that we should be looking at that roll up or affect that overall, like, can a user do what they need to do? yes or no metric. Um, so I think it's in partnership, in, like empowering technical resources on the team to set their own metrics about code quality um, and kind of evolve and build that, that program as well. Um, on a more granular level, we've started tracking things like average number of pushbacks per story so that we can see, hopefully we're getting better at you know, are we building the right thing in the right way the first time? Um, where do we need to adjust our process? Um, and then also, I think this is important to every organization, but trying to keep, keep a handle on with enhancements or new functionality, you know, how many bugs have you introduced? What got through that maybe you shouldn't have gotten through um, and trying to keep a pulse on that as well. So um, definitely still evolving, but we're trying to look at a number of different metrics. That's great. It's wonderful to hear from that product development side as well, from your expertise. So Rakesh, this question is for you, and it kind of goes back to that quality dashboard that Stefan was talking about. So in your experience as a project management practice lead, um, what is that ideal threshold for QA or UAT bugs or errors? That's a very good question, actually. Uh, not only because we need to define the threshold for QA and UAT, but, uh, but we also need to understand why we need that. Um, we, we cannot compromise quality at any cost, right? In fact, the one of the agile principle talks about it. Um, as far as the ideal threshold is concerned, it depends on, on, the, on the, how the team or the company want to set it and what are the criteria that you define for it. In my personal opinion, your quality uh, QA threshold should not be greater than twice your team size, which means if you have five team members, QA threshold should not be greater than 10. And for UAT, it should not be greater than the size of your, your team members. So we have been measuring thresholds this way from last, I guess, five to six years now, and it, it worked pretty well for us. Uh, we, have, we have produced very high quality code in each sprint, just because of 
because of the thresholds on the QS, QS side. So now to answer the second part, which is why we should have it, this, this, this will bring us um, the concept of transparency across the team as well as across the company. That's what we are using. Uh, Stephen, Stephen has shared a graph during the presentation and uh, that shows us how we are doing as a team on the quality parameter, right? That graph is not, not to micromanage the team members, but to bring the transparency, right? In, in every retrospective meeting, team should look at those parameters, how we are doing on the quality, uh, where the la uh, gaps are and how we can cover the quality issues if we, if we have more quality issues than the defined threshold. That way you can have an action plan to improve on the quality. That's, that's my feeling is. Great, thank you so much. That's very helpful to kind of hear that kind of defined number or what about what that should be, what that should look like. So excellent. So another uh, strategy or I guess area that the audience said um, that they've kind of faced as a challenge was security. So this next question is for you, Stefan, on security. Um, how do you ensure that security is a part of the initial product design and implemented throughout the development and launch of your product? Well, um, you know, I, I feel there are two aspects to it. One is you need to build it into your people. Um, so which means for the training, as I said already, um, people need to understand um, on a higher level uh, and, and in the nitty gritty that security is important. So we need to talk about it regularly. So uh, not just once and then it's done. I think um, every six months you need to have a refresher course on security, make sure that everyone understands it. Um, for your, for your, as I already mentioned um, uh, about the OWASP uh, training that one can do. The, the other part of it is to put it, um, to build it into your processes. So it, it must be part of your checklist as you start up a new project, security must be there. Uh, it must be in, in your templates. If you, if you have like a, a high level system diagram and you have a template for that, you have a block that talks about security, for instance. Um, it, wherever um, you have documentation, that should be there. It should be in your schedule. So you need to make sure that you have um, schedule uh, every month. Um, if that is if that is the uh, the rhythm you want to follow, every month you have a security meeting in your project, and you need to look at these things and you have a checklist that you go through your security. So, yeah, um, that is the way. I mean, you need to you need to be persistent. Um, one need to build it into your people. You need to build it into your processes. Great, that's very helpful, Stefan. And Maggie, from your perspective as a digital project manager, um, what security practices have you found to be most effective at mitigating security risks when working with a distributed team? Mm -hmm. um, I have found if the organization takes the time up front to establish their security guidelines, their best practices, their must haves, and then it is able to effectively document and communicate that those guidelines or, or those expectations. Um, and then um, kind of in coordination with that, create tools and make available tools for the team to use to facilitate that strategy. Um, that's how the team is going to be successful. Um, I like to think about it as what is the user experience to facilitate security best practices internally. So from a product perspective, you're typically designing for you know, the external user, external customer. But when it comes to security, you're, you are designing for the folks on your distributed team. So how can you set, set and clarify those expectations around security and then provide the tools to enable the team to work in the most secure way? That's great. Thank you so much, Maggie. And this will be our last question for the panel discussion, and then we will transition to the live Q&A. So Rakesh, in your opinion, what do you believe is the greatest security risk distributed teams face and how can they overcome it? Uh, I think when it comes to security, every small uh, small loophole or security threat, threat is, a, is a bigger one. Um, I, I have been working with the different teams in the in the past five or six years, and all the teams have that issue, right? And all of all of them are equally important when it comes to the security issues. And it could be small, it could be a big one, right? But we, we cannot take it lightly. We need to do what we need to do to make sure that we are secure in every aspect, whether it's on the code level, whether it's on the server level, whatever, um, uh, I mean, aspect we, we want to cover, right? 
in the past many years many teams has has difficulty dealing with this problem how to how to solve that problem um, there might be somebody working on a on a coffee shop right and he might be transferring important data over a unsecure uh, wi-fi connection which expose that person or the important data to the hackers probably right so i think the biggest threat even more than that is not spending enough time on the training about security for the team members team members should be trained to take security vulnerabilities and anything which is related to security on a on a topmost priority even more than qa qa issues you need to have a company policies around security and you need to make sure that everybody in the team is following those those principles or those policies that you have defined and it's imperative that that we need to invest in our people so that they can follow those defined principles and best practices to make sure that we are secure from every aspect that's that's what i would say that investing in people to train them about different security loopholes is is topmost priority that's a, if you are not investing or if you are not doing anything to train people i think that's the biggest threat more i i would say more than the actual security loopholes that's great. Rakesh, thank you so much for your insight on that. And that kind of ties into this next question. So we're going to go ahead and transition to our live audience Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like us to answer, go ahead and submit it in the Q&A and we'll try to answer those. So this first one, I'm just going to open it up and whoever would like to answer it can go ahead and do that. So let me just go ahead and read it. It says, you mentioned company culture in the presentation, and I find this to be a real challenge. How do you grow and embed the company culture in remote teams? I've always started new associates with a training block where uh, where we could fir uh, firm the company culture while you see them on site. But now during COVID, we're sitting with distributed teams and it's more difficult. So again, the question is, how do you grow and embed the company culture in, re in remote teams? Yeah, so let me try that one. Um, <laughs> you know, because I, I agree that your, your company culture is very, very important. Um, your culture contain um, the, the things that make you that make you special. Uh, it uh, it helps your people to to find a home um, and and so now in in COVID times we um, you know I think we have uh, we've we've been doing this training also for people as they start and we continue to do that. Um, so you know we can still do the training, um, but obviously now it's a Zoom call. And, um, but I found that uh, it can be equally effective um, to, to still do the training. People need to understand what your, what your culture also one should, um, even, even if it's remote, you need to make time for the training, that's important. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one calls. What we've done during COVID is to have many, many more one-on-one -on -one calls with people. It takes more time, that's for sure, but it is much more effective in instilling the company culture into people. So it is, um, that's, that's what we've we found. You know, we had a full schedule all our management team were busy with um, with one on ones, and uh, you know everyone in our company can testify to to that. That um, you know, I people uh, really appreciate appreciated it. They understood our culture much better. That it was a time to mentor them, to guide them, to answer their questions, you know, to still their fears. And um, so that's that's what I found. I don't know if any one of you want to add to that. Yeah, I would like to add, Stephen. Uh, that's very true. I think when it when it comes to the company culture. Uh, it's not a one-time effort. You need to continue reiterate the the things that you that you own to all the people. Like as you said, that we start the training as soon as somebody joins us, and that's not the only only place when we um, talk about the culture. It's a repetitive process, and you need to keep doing that to to make sure that nobody is falling behind on the on the company culture. That's what I wanted to add to that. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, kind of right along those lines. I think it's really important um, after you introduce company culture um, to then put it into action in terms of like the language or vocabulary that you use and continue like bringing it up in meetings. Um, so, you know, if there's a certain set of values that's defined by your company, like how are you talking about those values in relation to the work that you're doing or that the team is doing? You know, how, how is it coming up in conversation in order to like actually execute um, on those values? 
Um, and then another thing that came to mind is I think it's really important to intentionally invite people to the conversation or certain relationships, you know, inside jokes or invite them to share in that company history um, and be intentional about that. Because I think so often it's like, oh, you come in new to an organization and you feel like you don't, you don't know anything and, and you don't know kind of like all the history that this team has um, behind them. Um, but if you're intentional about inviting new people into that conversation and allow them to create their own history with the company, I think it's really impactful. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your insights for that one. So I think we have time for one more audience question, then we're going to wrap everything up. So um, here's the last question. So it says, can you speak to your experience and or strategies for migrating a team from email as a primary means of communication to a collaboration platform in order to maintain velocity, provide visibility, accessibility, and to maintain documentation? can take a stab at this one, um, just because this is, this is pretty fresh in my mind coming from an organization that was very email heavy um, to an organization that's very email light. Um, so I found that I needed to really be intentional about communication styles with different members of the team. Um, I think the question talked on or touched on documentation which is really easy. It's easy to facilitate documentation and like written content when you rely on email very heavily. Um, so when you're making that transition to non-email based communication, um, I think it's important to have a process or um, system to take, you know, things that come up in discussion, questions that are answered, content that's generated in that collaboration discussion and make sure that as a team, you're periodically reviewing it and saving it in a format and where it needs to be saved. I think that's a really big opportunity and can help. You're not bogged down by email, but through all this great chat you know, conversation, you likely have a lot of content and a lot of internal knowledge that's being shared there. It's just, you know, taking the next step and gathering all that content and organizing it so that you know it facilitates better documentation. And I know that's not easy. It is, you know, it does take time and effort. Um, so it, it's definitely a balance, but um, it's very valuable. We found that that many of the um, uh, maybe maybe the people from the earlier generation, and I'm almost there now, um, are more inclined to work with email. And uh, and some people are just not technology technologically savvy so they find it much more difficult to get away from their email and, and go into this collaboration uh, tool so so we um you know i agree with with maggie that um taking it then and, and putting it into the tool is, is necessary but we also try to to make the original source to be that and so we spend some time with all the members showing them the detail explaining to them how to work with this collaboration tool uh, and when to use it and all that and even then, if they then do send an email to you, which, which, which should have rather been in there, to, you know, one need to gently reply and say, well, maybe just go and update this into the ticket. And, or, you know, can I help you with that? And so it is, but one has to be intentional about that as well. You need to make sure that, uh, that you do it. Um, in, in our feedback um, emails that we send, for instance, we still send some feedback emails, but we sometimes send just the ticket numbers or the, you know, the, the story numbers in those and say, so this is what we worked on. So that the person is forced to click on that so that he actually goes into the tool and see it there and then make his comments there. So that's another way. But yeah, it is a struggle for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Maggie, Stefan, and Rakesh. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions today. However, if you have more questions, we'd be happy to talk with you further. You should be able to see our contact information on the screen shortly. Um, and later today, we'll be sending out a copy of today's recording and the slide deck if you'd like to look at that. And in an effort to continue bringing valuable content, we would appreciate your feedback on this webinar. 
We will be putting the, a link to a short feedback survey in the chat. And if you could take a minute to fill it out, we'd really appreciate it. And lastly, we'd like to give a big thank you to Stefan for sharing his expertise with us and in, in his insightful presentation, as well as to thank Maggie and Rakesh for their time and willingness to share practical strategies to more effectively run distributed agile teams. So thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our webinar and we look forward to seeing you next time.